join us. Um, welcome to this session. Um, I understand that this might be a, a tough session to uh, to go through. I know it's 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 late evening here, and uh, for many people have traveled quite far, and for them, you know, jet lag wise, it will be middle of the night. But I hope that we can keep this, you know, fairly energetic to keep everybody awake. Um, and you know, there is probably no topic that's closer to the core of play the game than better governance and dirty tricks. So I think we will be able to uh, to do something really, really, really good with this. Um, just to introduce the panel, um, we have um, Christina from Play the Game, who will go through the sports governance of server. We got Ivan, who is going to talk about the stakeholders' uh, position in volleyball in Europe. Then we got Jakob, who is going to talk about um, how it is for a new federation to try to gain access to uh, to funding and to, to the Olympics. Um, and then at the end, we got Mike, who is going to talk about um, the reforms in the International Ice Hockey Federation. We were also supposed to have um, we were also supposed to have um, somebody from UEFA, um, but he will not be here, not because he's running scared. I think he'll be happy to be here, but he didn't manage to get a visa for the, for the US, so he was not allowed in the country. Um, uh, due, to, uh, due to some travels he's done uh, in, in, in his role for UEFA, he, he, he went to Iran, and that uh, meant that he couldn't gain access to the US, so he's sadly not gonna be here. Um, and then we got Sarah from the International Ski Federation who will then join in in the panel um, and answer some of the questions, comment on some of the presentation that you will hear and, uh, and answer some of the questions that you guys might have afterwards. So I think we have, uh, we have a, a very good panel, we have a very good topic. Um, so I think we'll just kick off and I'll invite Christina up here to go through the new findings of the Sports Governance Observer. Thank you, Mikko. It is true, I will be presenting um, a new study just conducted by Play the Game, which is the Sports Governance Observer 2019. Um, I'm challenged tonight because not only are you getting tired and your jet lag kicks in, and also um, uh, it's late, you just ate, and uh, hopefully it will be able to keep you awake, but uh, I'm also challenged because I'm presenting a study that I haven't been involved in myself. Actually, it's a former colleague of mine, Jens Elm, who, who deserves all the credit for the study, but uh, he just recently left Play the Game and went back to Sweden, where he's from, so um, he couldn't be here today to present, but I'll do my best to, um, to introduce the study and the results. So um, for a little more than a decade, or almost a decade, Play the Game has been involved in studies in good governance and sport. And for those of you who might not be familiar with our studies, these are the, the research reports that we have been producing. We started um, actually with a, a, a European-funded study back in 2013 called the, the Agis study. And, and that study led to this first sports governance observer that we uh, presented in 2015. Um, and this is, uh, these, all these studies have been um, benchmarking studies where we have looked at federations either at the international level or at the national level to try to, to benchmark them and see how they're doing on, um, on various uh, parameters for good governance. Um, of course, these studies have limitations, as all studies can have. Um, we have, in, in all these studies, been looking at um, policies on paper. And as we heard from earlier today, it takes people to do good in, in administration. But at least these studies provide us with um, a foundation to discuss how the situation is in, in sport with regards to governance. So at least that's the, that's the framework where we're working in. Um, very important when we speak about these studies is that the intention has never been to point fingers at anyone or any federation. It's always um, 
something we do to encourage discussion and provide a framework for, for talking about what can be improved in sport and um, where more work needs to be done. I should say that currently we are involved in a new type of study for Play the Game. We're looking at not federations, but anti-doping organizations. That's also a European Union funded uh, project that we will be um, finishing next year. So watch out for that. But the first study, just to give you a background, was the Sports Governance, Obs Sports Governance Observer from 2015. It was a study that we, um, we did with Arnaud Gerhardt from KU Leuven, and he made a report studying all the 35 Olympic federations where he looked at um, four dimensions, um, transparency, checks and balances, democracy, and solidarity. And this study showed that um, these federations were actually performing very poorly. Um, only 75% made a, a, a score on our scale above, uh, no, below 50. So in general, they, they, they didn't perform very well. Only eight of the 35 federations published their agenda for board meetings on websites. Um, only four federations published decisions from board meetings and general assemblies. And, and only six out of the 35 federations published their annual reports. So the status back in um, 2015 was really, really poor. Then, from, from this international level, we thought it would be interesting to look at the national level. So we formed a group of uh, project partners to, um, to take a look at national federations in nine European countries, where we, in all those countries, looked at the same sports. Handball, swimming, athletics, football, and tennis. And then three federations that the project partners could choose on their own. Um, basically, what this study showed was that uh, the level of good governance varied greatly between countries and between sports. And what matters most is the country where you're studying. So results were more even in across country than across sport. Um, but basically, all in all, huge variations between, between the studied countries. So a few words about the tool that we have been using to do these benchmarking studies. Um, as I mentioned, we, we look at four dimensions, which are here. Um, across these dimensions, we look at 46 principles. Um, and for the national study, there was 274 indicators, which is basically questions that can be answered with a yes or no question. Um, so it's a sort of a checklist um, that researchers have been using to, to, do, to look at the Federation's level of governance. So what you see in the bottom of this slide is the, the traffic light system that we use to evaluate the, the level of governance in, in the Federations. And, and that's really easy to interpret. You will see when you see the results in a minute. Um, and here's just a quick example of, of how it looks. This is, uh, this is one indicator, the first indicator under transparency. And you see there are some um, questions to the far left side, and all the questions need to be answered with a yes or no. Then there are opportunities to, to provide some comments, but basically the result needs to be either a yes or no, whether the, the indicator have been implemented or has been imp implemented or not. So we did that for the national level, and then we went back to the international level in 2018, where we, um, we, we used the same, or we looked at the same federations that we did at the national level, 
but just on the international level. So again, it was athletic, football, handball, swimming, and tennis. Um, but in this study, uh, we, we needed to add some more principles. So we had 57 principles and in total, 309 indicators, 309 questions um, to be answered, which is a lot, obviously. Um, then finally, for the study I'm presenting today, the results, the Sports Governance Observer 2019, which you have or which you can grab in the, at the registration desk. Uh, we, ju we just published it, and um, for this study, we looked at six federations, um, which was equestrian, skiing, biathlon, ice hockey, volleyball, and gymnastics. Uh, and we chose those federations because we wanted to compare their level of good governance to the first study we did back in 2015. Um, we approached all these federations and asked them or informed them that we were going to do this study and uh, invited them to cooperate and participate. Um, and what you see is that the three first ones, they really participated actively and engaged in a dialogue with us about the results. We didn't get any response from ice hockey or volleyball and gymnastics declined to participate. However, we did the study anyway. So we, um, we gathered the data based on what federations published on their website. And of course, it, 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 is, it helps if you engage in a dialogue, and that's really the basis of, of this study, that we, we do the independent research, but we engage with the federations to get their feedback and give them opportunities to provide comments or make corrections um, where needed. So you should keep that in mind when you see the results that those federations that chose to cooperate will necessarily do better than those who didn't have a chance or chose not to participate. That, that's, that's important to mention. And for the results, um, it's very easy to see. Using this traffic light system, you will see that there are some, some patterns in, in the groups where there is a lot of red marks. In, in transparency, there are some red groups of answers in, in the lower sections of transparency. And, and the same goes for um, democratic processes. And the next two dimensions, internal accountability and social responsibility, it's the same. Um, some, of the, some of the indicators produce more red or federations have more trouble with some of the indicators than others. But of course, the devil is in the detail, as it always is. So this, this, this is just an overview of the results, and we need to, to, to dig a little deeper. But another way to show the results is by these charts, um, which shows that uh, Equestrian and FIS, like in the 2015 study, performed best um, again. And they have, they have uh, improved even since, uh, since 2015. And then we have uh, three federations performing moderately and, and the IBU weekly. It should be said, and, and this is also important to know, that the IBU, because of the corruption case and the scandal that was um, revealed uh, within recent years in, in IBU, they have, they have uh, engaged in a in a reform process, uh, a serious reform process. So they are just these days, I think just uh, next week, I, I believe, they have a general assembly where they are putting forward um, many new measures for, for changes in their status and statutes and, and policies. So that should be noted as well. But they were helpful in the, in the process anyway. And then when we look at the four dimensions of the study, um, we see again how each federation uh, perform on the various dimensions and to the far left you will see the, the SGO index, which is really what this study uh, 
produces um, as results, overall results. And again, um, most federations perform below 50% on the scale, um, with only two federations actually uh, performing very well. So what did we find of uh, strengths in the study? There has definitely been some improvements in federation statutes over the recent years. We see clearer governance structures. Um, we see more clear separation of powers, at least on paper. Uh, we see code of conducts, policies implemented in all federations now. Um, that, that's an important change or a significant change since the 2015 study that all international federations now have these codes of conduct that obliges board members to, um, to follow and where they can be sanctioned if they, if they breach for corruption or, or whatever it could be. Some federations have also improved on, on monitoring, so they have s some kind of a independent uh, overview of their activities, uh, which is also new, and finally more whistleblower systems have been implemented in, in across the federations. But most importantly, publication of documents has improved greatly since 2015. Much more federations produce or publicizes um, both uh, minutes from board meetings, general assemblies, and agendas, so more information is available. Transparency has definitely improved. And then for the weaknesses, there's still a lot, to go, a lot of work, work to do. Um, Almost none of the federations do risk assessments or corruption risk assessments. Um, and especially in the area of conflict of interest, there's definitely still some work to do um, where federations don't, if, if they have conflict of interest policies, they fail to report on them and follow up on them. So they don't publish um, what, what types of conflict of interest that there could have been in, in a federation over a year. Um, and, and what they have done with it. Um, so that, that's definitely um, an area that we identified for improvement. Uh, yeah, so now, across the, the federations that we surveyed, only one, one federation still do not publish their, um, their minutes of board and committee meetings. Wrapping up, yeah. But basically, that was wrapping up. So, on that note, <laughs> yeah. You should get um, a copy of the report out at the registration desk because it provides much more detailed answers that, that I was able to give here. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, and it was very nice to talk about democratic processes but also societal role and I think the next two speakers are going to talk about you know how do how do we improve the societal role in a democratic process so uh, our next speaker uh, Ivan is going to speak about uh, the stakeholder approach uh, in volleyball in Europe um, so uh, yeah please take it yes. <laughs> yes I'm I'm going to talk about also about you can see about the FIVB because we don't need to show it and respond to the requests of the of these uh, inquiries because if we don't compare to anybody we are the best so that's why they didn't even answer okay anyway uh, I'm here in the name of the Association of the Professional Volleyball Clubs but first I would like to present myself my name is Ivan Milkovic I'm coming from Serbia originally I'm a three times Olympic uh, on, um, participant at the Olympic Games. I won with the Serbian national team. At that time with the Yugoslav volleyball national team, I won the gold medal in Sydney 2000. I used to play 22 years professionally for the professional clubs around Europe, even more. I used to play in Italy, in Greece, in Turkey, in Qatar trying and managed to win at least one championship in each country. I used to play 250 games for the Serbian 
Serbian Montenegro and Yugoslavian volleyball national team and winning as many as 50 medals. I used to be a um, vice president of the Serbian Volleyball Federation for two years and at the same time a member of the National, uh, National Olympic Committee of Serbia and the president of the Athletes Commission. So I've, I've been meeting some of the people from the Athletes Commission in different meetings. After all this, I currently am working for the Association of the Professional Volleyball Clubs. You can see the, the name, it's in French because we are situated in, in Switzerland and like many international federations, we just took the name in, uh, in, in French. I'm here uh, to tell you about the current situation of volleyball, not only in, uh, in Europe, a little bit in more internationally around the, around the globe. Then I'm going to do to tell you what we are going to try to do about that situation in order to, to change something and help our members, the professional volleyball clubs. Huh, from where to start? So 90% uh, of our members are from Europe since the professional volleyball and the organization of volleyball clubs is actually happening in Europe. Besides some small countries, some different countries like Brazil or like Japan or like South Korea that have some professional volleyball, but generally when we say professional, uh, I'm speaking in a way that we see ourselves as a professional people. Not only uh, the clubs, also the players, also the leagues, also the other stakeholders. Officially, we are not a professionals. Volleyball players or volleyball in general is not a professional sport. To be a professional sport, you need to be organized in a way that in the official documents you are rep recognized as a professional. The FIVB statute does not see us, nor any of the stakeholders, as a professionals. But from the other side, as you can imagine, in the official FIVB document, which, which is a statute, there is one special article saying that the president, for example, is responsible for the real estate investments in the name of the FIVB. So the real estate investments are much more important than all the stakeholders around, around volleyball. So what I can say about the, the, the current situation is in Europe is that in many aspects it's, it's quite absurd. Why I say absurd? Because the clubs, especially uh, as, as uh, some of the people from the football are used to say and they are saying that the clubs are the entrepreneurs of the sport, in our case, the volleyball, the clubs almost don't exist as a professional clubs in Europe. There are many clubs with the people who are crazy enough to give their money, to put the money inside without expecting that any of the money is going to return to them or without any possibility that in a decent future they're going to have anything back. It's just a a crazy idea that they find some interest in all this, maybe with another president of the club fighting between each other and then invest, giving and giving more. Sorry, investing is another thing, just giving more and more money. The situation is that the, the clubs as a stakeholders are not recognized anywhere. The players and the national leagues are not recognized anywhere. So. You can, you can also see that the players and also the clubs like we don't exist. There are, many of you know that there is a difference between the American model and the European model of the organization of sport. In Europe we have a so famous pyramid where the players are at the bottom and then the clubs come and then the national leagues and then the national federations and so on coming up to the international federation and everybody from the bottom and up is subordinated to somebody from above. But let me just tell you about one absurd situation that for example, there is a big, a big competition between the, uh, the national teams or let's say the national federations and the clubs fighting for the calendar, which is a very important topic for everybody and trying to get as much 
time as possible for the for the competitions and for the national leagues. And in one moment, there is a, 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 a good conflict of interest, a big conflict of interest, where the same person is attending the meetings and discussing with the International Federation and with the European Federation, representing at the same time both the clubs and the National Federation, which is, which is absurd. Of course, the person is going to give more importance to the national team's calendar instead of the national club, uh, uh, clubs and the national, national leagues. The other thing is that the transfer system that we have, and some of you are already aware of that, that if one player wants to go to another club, even if he or she, they don't have a contract, there, is, there are still some taxes to be paid because Many of you think that with the Bosman case, we solved all our problems. In volleyball, it's not like this. In volleyball, there are a couple of taxes that need to be paid, a couple of fees that need to be paid to a different, how they call them, a stakeholder, but they're not a stakeholder, so I would call them differently. But So you imagine that the player has to pay to the International Volleyball Federation a fee, an administration fee, just for the transfer. We are talking about the player who doesn't have a contract and wants to go from one country to another country. It ha he has or she has to pay a transfer fee to the International Volleyball Federation. He or she has to pay to the Federation of Origin from where he comes from and it's also called a transfer fee. He or she has to pay to the Federation where he's going to, to play and he or she have to play also to the agent. So everybody is paying something to somebody and at the end, many times it happens that the player signs a contract in May, the official transfer period starts in September, four months later, and then at the moment when the player has to pay all the fees, he is practically without the money from his contract because the club in September will never accept the additional fees to be paid. So, in many aspects, there is a, 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 an evident break of law, especially in Europe, of the European law. And many people have to be aware of this because when you talk to the people from the, from the, especially from the European Federation, they will always say, we don't have any problems because nobody is making any complaint. In order to make a complaint, you cannot go in front of them like one institution, like a union, like an association, because they don't accept this. They just tell you, go and speak with your national federation, and your national federation will have to speak with us. So anyway, beside that, we have also problems with the players going to play for the national team, where, for example, the players have a contract with the club for 10 months or in some, in some cases for 12 months and then they go to play for the national team for six months because we are, I think, one of the, if not the only sport where the national team season is longer than a national league season. And the national league should be the place where the, the players go to play and get a contract and get paid. We don't talk about the insurances that if the player goes to play, there are no insurances. It happened many times that the players got injured and were just brought back to the club and the club will take care of them. So, this association was not created in order to, to make a substitute or to make a, a rivalry with any international federation, especially with the European Volleyball Federation. The only thing is that some clubs who were supported and uh, let's say who were supported by private money and with the, from the people who really like volleyball and would like really to do something more was created to protect the interests and to find the possibility for the the clubs to invest even more because the regulations as of today are not able to support any initiative from anybody who wants to invest a little bit more. 
the thing is that what the, the association is going to try to do is that since we already sent them two, two invitations, both to the European Confederation and to the International Federation, we haven't received any answer from them. We wanted to discuss, we wanted to set, sit together and to see the possibility how we can add value to our sport. No answer till today. So that's why I was not surprised from the FIBB that they didn't answer. The only way to sit around the table is to call somebody who has more power than any of us, and that's the European Union. I hope that the, the future statement of objection that we are going to do in front of the European Commission, in front of the European Court, and the European Parliament is going to bring some possibility for all the stakeholders, because we are all involved in this, players, leagues, and also the clubs, are, is going to create a situation where we can sit together and create something that is much, much better than what we have today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is Jakob Beck from, uh, from uh, the Danish Surf and Raft Association. Uh, he's going to talk about um, sports uh, organization, how they try and stay attractive for the Olympic Games. Sure. Thank you, Miguel. Good evening. So, um, my presentation will give you a real life uh, example of the power struggle, um, the power imbalance and lack of good ethics in the leadership issues within the governance of international sport. The research from Play the Game, uh, the Governance Observer Project from 2015 is interesting in my mind. Uh, it covers 57 indicators on the four themes, but there's still a lot more issues that are relevant to look at and that have implications for the development and governance of sport on the international and the national and local level. I think uh, that it's too narrow just to look at the IFs. It's important also to look at the national federations, the NOC, the governance of the Olympic multi-sports organizations as well. And because they are interconnected and everybody together is influencing the frames and possibilities for the growth and development of sport on the recreational and elite level. So this case with me representing a sport that used to be and live outside the Olympic family and are still on the travel inside the organization gives a very good perspective for looking at the world uh, and the Olympic family from outside and now within. The IOC reforms and push for changes on different levels within sport and the Olympic Sports Organization have forced the IFs to also implement, implement reforms and to pursue change. This has effectively also made impact on the national level, especially in the frame of the NOC needing to adapt the inclusion of the new Olympic sports, surfing, climbing, karate, skateboard, and baseball. But the way the change is coming to life is maybe not so impressive after all. The case I will look into and present for you is the one of the ICF, the International Canoe Federation, that indeed, indeed had felt the push from IOC since long time. In an IOC evaluation, Report from 2013, canoeing was shortlisted as the bottom five out of the Summer Olympic sports and the risk of being thrown out from the Games. One of the main arguments for the problems was with the gender imbalance, actually an issue that was already covered at the Play the Game conference in 2013 by Pam Potiller, a female canoe athlete and also representative from the Women Can. They had pushed for more events for women in the Olympics for canoeing since uh, only five out of 16 events were with women. So the risk for Olympic organizations losing the Olympic status is severe. As you can see for ICF, they receive almost 100% of their income streams from the IOC. From my experience and uh, personal research into this, it seems that we're witnesses in these years different strategies for the federations to try to challenge the quest for change. One of them is, of course, developing of own sports, create more interesting events and improve the gender balance. But uh, it's more interesting to look into the next two ones, the ones where they interfere and block to try to lower the threats from other sports, to block new sports introduction to multi-sports events, block new sports membership to multi-sports organizations or to the NOC. And the third one, colonize new trend sports. It is the hostile takeover of sports. 
sports that may already be developed and governed by another international sports federation. So in the following, I'll look into the latter two, which I believe is extremely problematic in relation to good leadership, ethics, and governance in our organizations. If you look to the SGO index that uh, Play the Game made in 2015, ICF is uh, around in the middle. Uh, Christina said it was poor general for, for all of them, but the main weaknesses in the report are stated like weak procedures for deciding host of main events, lack of audit and ethics committee, and lack of term limits and no annual general assembly meetings. So maybe it's not such a big deal when you look at the conclusions. But after the shocking evaluation from IOC in 2013, ICF began a lot of different activities in order to work with the crisis and better the situation. One of the activities was to look at new sports that could have a potential for future Olympic inclusion. So in 16, ICF at the general meeting voted for in inclusion of SOP as a new competition discipline and boat category. The action was a little bizarre in terms of the sport of paddle surfing had been developed, matured and governed by IOC. International Surfing Association and its member federations for many years already. The timing was interesting because it was at the same time where National Surfing Federation, hence also the sub-federations, were becoming member of the NOCs because of surfing becoming Olympic sport in 2020. And the timing was interesting because ISA, together with shortboard surfing, was applying IOC for inclusion into Olympic Games 2020, 24, Youth Olympic Games 2018, Anarch World Beach Games and Pan American Games in 2019. So the conflict and the process and the case have been reported by New York Times, played a game inside the games and numerous water sports blocks over the last three years, but it has not seen so, make, so big interest from investigative journalism. New public sports represent a threat to existing Olympic sports and will the new sports organization eventually win the battle and be represented at the games in the future? So ICF could not risk this and oppose the application from within the system as part of being on the executive board of the Association of Summer Olympic International Federations. The other strategy is to claim a sport, claim a sport in front of IOC, a multi-sports organization on the national levels. Eventually also working towards building the capacity to run its own events with no regard to the current history, culture, and governance already existing within the surfing organization since many years. So the first attempt was last year in 2018, where ICF tried to get a world championship in SUP to be a part in Portugal. But the Court of Arbitration for Sports in Portugal stopped this because of the Surfing Federation already being recognized both on the government and NOC level. This year, it seems like they'll have the chance to, to get the event running in China. So the colonize of a new sport will happen in China, but this is uh, maybe not a world event. Everybody can participate. I signed up myself, as you can see on the right side of the screen. So no national selections. It's just an, a, a straight aim to try to get an event with as many participants as possible to have a track record that they don't have before now. Moving on to, to the other case here, is uh, the case of rafting, where ICF leaders are being even more creative in ways to attract the governance control over another popular water sport. Hooking up with a splendor and renegade group from the current rafting community from nations from Ra Italy, Russia, and Turkey, a project to form a new competing world organization emerge, cooperating with the top ICF leaders. And this even being also more bizarre because of the RRF, International Rafting Federation, had been developed and governed the sport since 97. So can it be true that our top political leaders inside IOC is acting like this? Is this the leadership that we would like to see continue in the future ahead? Is this the way IOC wants to make a change? The new president from the new organization says, we have close contacts with ICF President Peru Reina, ICF Vice President Tony Estanguet, who is also sh chief of the Olympic Games in Paris, and the treasurer from ICF, Luan, Luciano Bonfiglio, all are in tune with the project. So meeting up with the top leaders, forming this organization, going to the slalom worlds in, uh, in Pau, in France, in the, in the fall, moving on to, to a new year, with all these people involved on different uh, Olympic levels inside the Italian team uh, with friends from the bobsled IOC members uh, connected all the way up to, to the IOC members, 
they would be able to pretty fast or only a year to form this new organization in, uh, in February 2018, making an agreement between ICF and the new organization in April. And in May, ICF tried to get their members to, to sign agreement with the new federation. This all came with a convenient time as the International Rafting Federation in January same year had delivered the organization's application for membership to Global Association for International Sports Federations, only to find that the process that is still going on to be opposed by, guess who? The ICF. So here, the letter from uh, Philippe Geisbuller, the head of the administration from Geis. The Geis Membership Commission has been informed that another international organization is claiming to be the world governing body for rafting. World Rafting Federation. We have also been informed that this organization has signed a cooperation agreement with the International Canoe Federation in April 2018. And the latest development in this saga is the ICF putting up rafting as one of the disciplines during the 2020 edition of the Pan Am Master Games in Brazil next year. Conveniently run by IMGA, where Perurena is also on the board. Now, this is not unique to ICF, canoeing and water sports, but it's a good case to look into. Um, there are other sports uh, facing the same uh, difficulties right now. I think we need to look into how the top leaders are acting, both the one pulling the dirty tricks, but also top leaders that are looking the other way, not raising their voices, not taking a stand. Is there a future without the dirty tricks? Or is the power and economy in the Olympics, the Olympic Games, so important and compelling that it is impossible for the leaders to step back when the neutrality is an issue? This is certainly an area that needs investigation from journalists in the future, as well as researchers to find and dig into the case stories that are unfolding right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, now I invite our last speaker up here. Um, uh, that will be Mike Mac McNamee, who is uh, from Swansea University uh, and uh, the University of Leuven. And I've also been informed that he is uh, the director of the master program on sports ethics and integrity. Um, and you're going to talk about the International Ice Hockey League. I am. Thank you very much. Like my colleagues, I can't actually see over the top of this thing. <laughs> they can have to stand to the side. There we are. Okay, so uh, today's uh, uh, presentation uh, is um, authored by Gareth Parry and myself. And Gareth was one of our master students. I don't need to get it down, actually. That's more like it. Um, we started this two year master degree called Maisie. And, um, the, the European Commission gave us a lot of money to start it up, but we managed to get some scholarships as well from sports, and the International Ice Hockey Federation uh, gave us some cash to sponsor a student, and the, the relationship would be that when the student came to do their thesis, they would base it on a problem uh, experienced by the International Ice Hockey Federation. So uh, that's what happened. It's uh, quite a long report. It's about 50, 55 pages. So I'm going to talk about it in 10 minutes. So I'm just going to go for the highlights, but I'm happy to share uh, the report with you. It was part of a, a modernization agenda on behalf of um, the IHF. And um, if you don't know, the International Ice Hockey Federation is the largest of the, the winter sport federations. It's the most successful uh, economically and commercially. Uh, its president, I think, has been in post now 25 years. Uh, which is a staggeringly long time. And over that 25 years, he and the team around him have brought about quite incredible uh, economic and sporting successes. So there has been for a very long time absolutely no reason why anybody wants to rock the boat. It's delivering all the things they want it to deliver would be the general perception. Uh, the general secretary has tried to bring about uh, certain reforms and at... Uh, the Congress two years ago didn't make any progress whatsoever. So this research has to be positioned in a journey of a very traditional international federation who has got a, a very smart, very capable, very political uh, president 
and an equally smart general secretary who want to modernize things, but the question is how much and how quickly. Uh, and the final part of the backdrop would be a president who has declared that they won't stand again. And, and that's really quite an important fact. So uh, what we did is to try to take a look at, I don't know where I should be pointing this thing, sorry. Okay. Is to try to look at um, doing this research in the context of organizational change. And fortunately for the IHF, they weren't under condition three, which the UCI, FIFA, the IAAF, and other organizations found themselves in. And there was, if you weren't here in the last session, there was a brilliant phrase. Uh, the chair said, you should never waste a good crisis. Brilliant phrase. Uh, but in this case, they didn't have a crisis to waste. In fact, everything seemed to be going swimmingly well. So you are all very well aware of um, uh, Arnaud Geret's um, Sports Governance Observer, so I don't need to go through that. I'm really sorry, I don't know where I should be pointing this. Thank you very much. Uh, what we can see is uh, three points at the bottom, though. Um, they did have an ethics committee, which I helped, uh, helped them set up. But really importantly, the ethics committee only had advisory functions. So uh, the president uh, and the council could set before the committee a problem and just say, what do you think about it? And then we'd ruminate over it and give them some advice. But they could do what they wanted, essentially. Because uh, the committee only had advisory powers and it would advise the president, who then would see fit or not see fit to evoke change. They did have a code of ethics, but it's definitely in need of revision. But the last point is culture. Uh, and that's the crucial point which came out of uh, the observer. You know, FIFA came number two on the good governance observer. How does that happen? Well, they're only looking at processes. They're not looking at culture. And as everybody is well aware of, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what's really interesting about the culture uh, in the Ice Hockey Federation is everybody refers to it as a family. But you've probably also heard the phrase keeping it in the family, not washing your dirty linen in public. So they seem to have quite a tiny organization with very closely shared values which seemed to function very well along a lot of criteria and parameters. What's also uh, clear is that um, the code of ethics, most codes of ethics just sit on a shelf and nobody looks at them until somebody's done something wrong. But it, it seemed to be that the way things operated in the Ice Hockey Federation is people shared so many tacit understandings about how you should do things and not do things, nobody ever referred to the code everybody kind of tacitly understood what they could get away with, what they couldn't get away with. Um, there was a clear avoidance of legalistic approaches, but one of the difficulties in trying to understand as researchers what's going on is that you've got member national associations in a global international federation, but you've also got the, the Russian League, you've got the NHL, and then you've also got the emerging European League. So it's a really unusual mixture of organizational entities. Of course, the, I, the IHF have no governance over the Russian League or the NHL, but they can't exist without them because the major cash cow is the World Championships, which they play every year. So they're in this incredibly challenging situation. So we were brought in to do the research. Uh, these were our aims to provide an insight into the level of knowledge and understanding of key stakeholders' perceptions of uh, the International Ice Hockey Feder Federation's ethics and integrity, structure and functions. And I'll cut to the chase now and, and just tell you most of them knew nothing about it. Uh, these were really high stakeholders that we got hold of, right? These were people really genuinely driving the game. Many of them didn't even know there was an ethics committee. Uh, we were then supposed to provide insights into uh, how things might work better. What would happen if you tried to democratize uh, uh, structure and function of the IHF? And then we would try to give them recommendations about how to put these into practice. Very, very briefly, um, we did nine interviews. It's a very high sample. It got research ethics approval, so there was complete anonymity. 
And I think that's really important. So people genuinely could say whatever they wanted to say, things that I suspect they wouldn't say in open council or Congress. So uh, just to make sure that both of us, uh, trans uh, both of us uh, read all of the interviews and tried to give different codes, and then we came together and say, well, what codes do you think were important? Well, I think they're important, and so forth. Um, we did set up... a set of key themes. I won't go through all of these in any detail at all, but you can see the key themes. One is directly about the ethics, integrity, structure and function, the role of the committees. They seem to have a dispersed model of responsibility. Um, there were rules in place, but nobody seemed to care about them. They were much more interested in values, and those values were very tightly shared, I have to say. And they saw uh, the code of ethics as a kind of safety net. We're only ever going to use that if something really goes wrong. Otherwise, we'll deal with it outside of the committees on a one-to-one -one basis. Keep it friendly. Don't air it in public. Um, the management of key uh, stakeholders became really interesting, especially when you think about uh, the European League is, is a new league, a very important league uh, for the International Ice Hockey Federation. But you've got the NHL, which are all powerful, and you've got this yearly struggle to get the NHL players to come. So you've got to broker a really interesting relationship here. But the NHL don't have a code of ethics, especially. They have an ethics commissioner. So that all power is vested in the ethics commissioner. So you've got a completely different model of, of governance going on with one of your key stakeholders. And um, what I would say is about the integrity of the game, all of the stakeholders really, really cared about this. It's quite bizarre. You could go black and white. So when you talked about governance and good governance, principles, standards, rules, codes of ethics, most of them switched off. But when you started talking about ethical issues on the ice, everybody really got seriously engaged. So they had a, a simple view of ethics, and it is what happens when the players go out onto the ice. After that, ethics isn't important, which is a bizarre idea for these people who are leading uh, major organizations in ice hockey. Um, Turkeys generally don't vote for Christmas. So why should they be interested in ethics and governance reform? I'll just show you a couple of key quotations that I think are interesting. But this, this middle bit is a, a quotation here. Um, one of them thought there could be no such thing as clear red lines about ethics. You've just got wavy lines and you kind of apply them in practice. And on the one hand, you could say that's a very nuanced understanding of ethics. On the other hand, you could say that's way too flexible. Who gets to determine whether the line is straight or wavy? How you apply it strongly in the case of one athlete from a very powerful nation or another athlete from a very weak nation. So there's huge room for variability here. Um, here's, the, here's the on ice quotation. Another very common response when we try to say, Who's responsible for ethics in your organization? They would typically say everybody. So I would say back to them, well, if everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible, right? No reply. Again, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Um, this is a really strong statement by a very powerful stakeholder. The head of a major media outlet says, we want to change the structure and nature of competitions to make it more media friendly, more marketing friendly, more sponsor friendly. And their answer is no chance. They've got a really hard line over a really powerful economic goal. And yet when it comes to misconduct, whether in committees or by players, it's really not that important, as long as it doesn't affect the integrity of the, the, the match that's on the ice. On the other hand, you did get people saying things like, what we really need is change from the bottom up. But how are you going to get that when you've got a president who's been in place 25 years, who has formed networks of strategic alliances? No chance. So, so there were some dissenting voices. Um, there is one critical one here, though. One very brave person says, not only do we need an ethics code and committee, they've got to report directly, directly to council and stop reporting to the president. Because the president then has the power to decide what he is or isn't going to discuss. And R René uh, Fazel, who I like very much and I've known uh, several years, 
said openly in public about the Ethics Committee, he said, Mike, we're not appointing you to the Ethics Committee because you'd fire me. And he's saying it jokingly. But of course, there is a serious point there too. So, to, to finish up, um, they were successful. Uh, the General Secretary in particular strategically got through the recommendations. And I'll just read a couple of key, key highlights. One, we did get hold of unparalleled, un un nobody told us who we could interview. We decided who we wanted to go and interview and we kept it strictly anonymous. We made uh, 18 recommendations and here's, I think, the key one. Congress shall elect five members in accordance with the voting procedures of the council for the ethics board, so that person who, who was in the interview got his wish, in accordance with the statutes which have now been changed for a four-year period, only candidates with an age uh, bracket, 20, 21st and 75th birthdays, are eligible in that year for the board. All members are equal and completely independent of the council. They shall distribute tasks fairly and equally. And as part of performing its duties as set up above, the Ethics Board may request any kind of relevant information from all bodies, committees, officials, and other individuals within IHF and shall be entitled to conduct and authorise reviews into any matters within the scope of its duties. That's a massive change in two paragraphs. That is a sea change in political terms uh, and a recognition that IHF, successful as it has been, undeniably, is trying to step into the 21st century in terms of governance reform, and, and I very much applaud them for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, before I open uh, for questions, I just want to introduce our, our last panelist, which is Sarah Lewis, who is the Secretary General of the International um, Ski Federation. Um, and, uh, and before we open for questions, I just want to let you have some comments on the presentation that's already been here. Um, do you want to come up here or you can do it from, uh, from a table? So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pretty impressed uh, for a Sunday evening to see so many of you when you potentially would prefer to be at the bar. But uh, it's dedication to the cause, no question. I'm suffering a little bit from jet lag tonight, but um, I think that this uh, very stimulating discussion will, will keep me awake, and hopefully uh, you as well. Just like to uh, give some feedback to uh, Mike, who I'm meeting for the first time, that uh, I think it depends on what basis we uh, evaluate the size of uh, an international federation, whether or not uh, a federation is better by being larger, but with 132 member national associations and, and uh, ice hockey IIHF with 81, there's a very big difference in terms of the the member national associations of our two organisations, FIS is by far the largest of the international winter sports uh, federations. So uh, we don't need to go into discussions about resources uh, and, and uh, the, the what, what are generated there because that information isn't available in uh, the, the ice hockey um, annual report. So I can't comment on it, but um, uh, in any case, it's about uh, the activity that we're doing for the sport and how that's, how that's implemented in any case. So we can have a discussion on that bilaterally, potentially. The, uh, what I would like to just comment uh, on when it comes to this year's uh, uh, Sports Governance Observer report that was just released a couple of days ago from uh, one of the federations who's been evaluated this, uh, in this round, in 2019, the process has been, first of all, extremely professional uh, by um, uh, Jens, Christina, and the team. And uh, we were certainly somewhat daunted with the prospect of receiving 309 questions. That's uh, a chunk of work. and. Uh, when we've seen the impact of the previous reports, we were, yeah, 
we were yeah, relatively taken aback as to what we were going to be uh, encountering. But it's been so helpful. Uh, first of all, when I uh, have complimented the professionalism, this is because actually the organisation play the game, the Sports Governance Observer uh, team, they are actually filling out as many of the, the answers as they can to these 309 questions. So the information that they can access that's uh, readily available through your website, through your communication means, they're using. So that in itself uh, gives you a great, uh, a great basis to, to operate from. You know what's available, what they could find, and uh, clearly it's a big portion of the work done. Then there were very pertinent questions to some of the points. Is this correct? Is our assumption? Uh, and then there were other points that uh, you saw, hmm, yeah, we need to uh, do something here in terms of improving that information. So we had the opportunity to correct anything that we felt was actually incorrect or to add comments and also to update. Some of the information was established, uh, decided, but it was potentially behind a member section service. And what was the point? This should be in the public domain, so let's get it out there. So we had time in order to react in, in a good way. And uh, I think we exchanged two rounds of um, uh, backwards and forwards in terms of the actual content of the report. So this was an extremely helpful process, first of all, to undertake this, this so-called self-evaluation in terms of the information that was uh, already available and could be made available rather easily. So that's uh, to the process of, of this particular report. I would like to also add that both the Sports Governance Observer report and also uh, the International Federation's Governance Survey, which uh, has been carried out now twice, have both proven to be very, very valuable tools within the International Federations, certainly in the case of FIS, but uh, I think also with, uh, with other colleagues, to actually have uh, external expertise which has helped as a, as a platform to undertake further progress with uh, improving governance measures in very, very concrete ways. It's one thing from a management perspective coming up with uh, processes that uh, we believe are the correct ones to take, following best practices, uh, undertaking uh, various, various steps. But when we've got external expertise that is actually stating, uh, that is actually stating clearly in black and white, we're being evaluated, there are numbers flashing up, there are comparisons to our colleagues, to our counterparts, and uh, then when uh, different members of, of various influential committees, uh, the, the council, state, well, why did we only achieve this ranking and we haven't done well there? Well, we need to take some decisions. We need to take some decisions that are on your desk. So thank you to both organizations uh, for the help that, that you've actually provided and the, the catalyst that uh, the, both the Sports Governance Observer and the International Federation's Governance Survey have provided us with, and uh, really very clear and expert information that for sure will help us not only the steps that have been taken are in the process of being taken, but also will be taken in the future as a, as a result, have, have certainly been worth every one of the 309 questions and uh, hopefully in the future uh, the the process will um, will the opportunity will be given to us again to, to take the next steps so that's a, a short uh, yeah appraisal from from our side and uh, yeah criticism is well taken we see it as actually a, 
a, a platform to be able to improve further. So um, I would like to open the floor uh, for any questions to any of the speakers. So uh, yeah, who got the first question? Will anybody think Nils? Uh Nils Nygaard, the uh, president <coughs> of uh, NOC and Sports Confederation of Denmark. <coughs> Thank you for uh, five very good uh, presentations, very clear. Um, I would like to ask uh, Ivan and uh, Jakob uh, about your presentation or have a comment about uh, whether uh, we could have some reactions from the International uh, Volleyball Federation or European Volleyball Federation or from ICF because you, you made some very clear presentations, but I'd like to hear the point of views from, from the other side to hear what are their reactions uh, to what you have said. Uh, maybe it's not up to you to, to give those reactions because uh, you, you said there were really no reactions, but uh, maybe ask and play the game by how we can get those reactions. Well, if we're talking about the reaction, the reaction was pretty clear from the side of the European Volleyball Federation. We are an independent association and uh, we've been created by an independent uh, professional volleyball clubs. The reaction from the, from the European Volleyball Federation was like this. At the same moment, they decided to make their own association of the clubs. The thing is that we, st we still don't know how this uh, new association is going to be incorporated inside the European Volleyball Federation. Because uh, if you ask them, I'm going to be sure that they are going to answer you that all the stakeholders have their representatives inside the structure of the European Volleyball Federation. For example, there's an athletes commission inside the European Volleyball Federation and all the members of the athletes commission are appointed by the president. So we cannot say that the athletes are being represented independently. The other side, we still don't know if this new commission that the European Volleyball Federation wants to create in order to create another stakeholders representative commission uh, we don't know whether it's going to be like a commission which is going to be created by the president and all the members are going to be appointed by the president or is it going to be uh, an invitation to some, some of the clubs to elect their representatives but these representatives will also have to be, let's say, supported by the president. So in any way, none of them are going to be independent 100%. So what we are trying to, to do, not only for the clubs, but also for all the other stakeholders, is to be represented independently and elected freely, and then be involved in a decision-making process. This is not going to change a lot of things, but for the beginning, it's going to be a very, very big step for us. Thank you. And Jakob, do you have a comment? Well, it could have been very interesting to have uh, also the other side represented, if that's what your, your point is, Nils, to have it like a discussion of it. And, and some of the cases might even uh, need even more time than uh, just a 10 minutes presentation because there's so much uh, stuff in it. Um, the case is running in, uh, in CASA at the moment, so there's a lot of confidentiality about it. So probably also ICF wouldn't come and, and talk about the case uh, at the moment. But it, as uh, said, it has been reported uh, with what their position is also in some of the articles. In regard to the rafting case, uh, their position might not be so strong as with the, the standard paddle case uh, because uh, they are involved with this another organization. So there's a formal uh, 
application or consultants now with IMGA if uh, which federation should eventually uh, make the rafting event during the 2020 Pan American Masters uh, Games if ICF wanted to, to hold on to that or if they wanted to, to get involved with RF in this event. Perfect, thank you very much. And I think Jens have a question. Uh, no, actually I had an answer. Uh, because uh, I was, uh, I think there was a qu question uh, from from Nils Nygaard uh, uh, regarding, uh, you could say, the selection of, of uh, speakers. I would say generally we are out very very early to invite the IOC and uh, ASWAF and uh, and uh, other uh, major players, FIFA. Uh, but we could perhaps be more uh, careful. Uh, to make sure that there are uh, direct invitations to uh, some of the federations that we know will come under uh, scrutiny. I think we may have been a little uh, loose with that in recent years because we have so uh, much experience that we waste a lot of time issuing the invitations that are never answered. Uh, and we may have given up a little bit in advance, which we, of uh, course, uh, we I, 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 I would uh, be happy to tighten that procedure a little bit. With regard to the FIVB in particular, I think the chance that they would have come would have been very, very uh, thin uh, because they didn't even want, to they, they have simply not answered to our sports governance uh, observer requests for comments and, and I don't think they have even acknowledged they had received our mails. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a commitment for 2021. Sure. And I think we have a question down here. Thank you. Uh, Roland Jack from a company called I Trust Sports. The question for Christina. Thank you very much for the presentation. A huge amount of work has gone into that. One particular point you mentioned was about board evaluation. So we've actually just started doing board evaluations of national governing bodies in the UK quite recently. And we're finding they're quite hesitant. It's, it's, a, new, it's a new concept. I know it's been done at um, corporate level. I just wondered in Denmark, is it something you've been doing with governing bodies? What was it that um, led you to think that was an important uh, question to ask in the, in the study, given that it's perhaps still quite early days for board evaluation generally? Well, I think we are... Do I need to turn this on? Um, we are building on corporate models of best practice, and then that's why we included it, um, because it's... Yeah, it's common for especially financial institutions and, and corporate governances in general. So, um, but we found very few boards that evaluated themselves at the national level. And that's what the same what we saw in, at the international level. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who have a question they want to ask? Yes, down there at the end. Ryan Goetze, Thompson Rivers University. Um, a question for Mike. You mentioned that one of the reasons that the IAAHF might have been slow to change was because the NHL, it's one of its biggest stakeholders, has a strange governance model compared to, say, other IFs. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more on that, if maybe having your two biggest um, stakeholders in the NHL and the KHL being run in a very private business, top-down manner, maybe almost acted as a, a deterrent to change. I'm not sure I have anything desperately insightful to say, to tell you the truth. I'm not sure I know enough about the governance of those two leagues. What, what I could say is, um, even though you might situate them as private entities. They're wildly different in terms of culture. I mean, no one would expect uh, the Russian League to be run in anything like the same kind of way that the NHL is, is led. Equally, um, the IHF want to have both these leagues' best players playing in this crucial annual tournament. But in the Russian League, of course, uh, Olympic sport really means something. 
So all their players want to be in there. Now, that's not always true necessarily of the NHL. And of course, the people that pay these very large salaries in the NHL don't want their players playing in the world championships. So trying to find ways to structure agreements in fair, open, transparent, accountable kinds of ways is probably going to be a massive challenge here. And, and I don't know how a council comes to adopt one set of policies and procedures working with their NNAs and then a di different set of procedures and policies and practices with these two very powerful leagues and yet another way of dealing with the European League which is still emerging and doesn't have anything like the power base. So I, th I think they're in an incredibly different, difficult situation. Um, how should they deal with these things? Well, flexibly, I suppose you should say. I mean, if you're being really strict about it, the MNAs might come from very small organizations with very few uh, teams and uh, leagues, but who would have a vote when it comes to Congress. And they could say, why are we having these high-level discussions with external parties? People that aren't, strictly speaking, part of our framework. But of course, you can't deny the importance of those leagues in the world game. So I've got a huge degree. I, in fact, I don't know any other sports that have this kind of problem. So I have a huge degree of sympathy for them. And um, yeah, I, I don't have any great words of wisdom to offer you to your, to your question, though. Those are just two, two observations that I have. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any more question? If, if not, then I actually have a question for Sarah. So Sarah, now when you had this report being produced and the observer actually evaluating the governance of the International um, uh, Ski Federation, how are you gonna use it? How are you gonna use it in a way that hopefully will result in a better score for the next round? Well, we'll uh, evaluate the results. It's obviously only just very recently uh, been published and uh, look at the strengths and the weaknesses and working on the weaknesses. So there are some, some clear pointers in there. There are also some elements that are perhaps, uh, yeah, there, there are elements that can we handle those uh, without a, a general assembly decision they're the so-called easy to fix ones, um, but it doesn't seem to be the case from initial reflection. And then once it reaches uh, general assembly uh, level, that's more of a time consuming process. There are one or two in there that are rather perhaps for, for then the next phase uh, when it comes to um, the, the relatively detailed elements with the, um, uh, with the anti-corruption assessment throughout the organization. That might take a little bit longer, but uh, we need to look at ensuring that we've got the right steps underway in, in, in the right areas. And yeah, I think it's a kind of obvious uh, response in, in, in that respect. We're not uh, going to send letters of protest saying that we disagree with your findings and uh, this defending this, this and this. Uh, quite, quite the opposite, to be, uh, to be honest. And I think you've seen that also from the last one, it's proved a, a very useful catalyst actually to be able to, to take some steps. A uh, couple of examples. Uh, the, uh, and very relevant for the theme here, which is the uh, role that the athletes play within uh, FIS, within the, the, the organization, as well as being a former athlete myself. And uh, I forgot my Ollie badge tonight, which uh, normally belongs for these international events. But um, the FIS Athletes Commission always, since it was established, uh, consisted of one athlete per gender, um, per discipline. Uh, in fact, we had uh, two per gender, per discipline in the larger disciplines. Now that's been streamlined. And now we have uh, two athletes representing two genders and two different disciplines who are full members of the FIS Council. So that's been great. Uh, and uh, that's been, yeah, a combination of uh, evaluation 
from, from 2015, but also own initiatives there because our Athletes Commission has been a very effective uh, group and, and this was a, a combination of uh, their own requests and uh, that we saw, yep, this is a, a good way to go from also your evaluations and from, from our uh, International Federation Governance Survey. So do you think that having, having this report actually will make it easier? Will it create an awareness within the membership Definitely. to make it easier to get some of the changes through? Absolutely, yeah. We, we, and we can use it uh, in exactly that way and um, have communicated it uh, as such, basically, that, uh, yeah, we've made a step. We've made a step since 2015, but uh, let's make another step and perhaps two steps. Okay. And, Mike, did you have a comment on to this? Yes. Uh, yeah, just to the, to the questioner who asked me the question about the leagues, uh, I did make one little point and I forgot to mention it. But there are people in this room who know uh, ten times more than I do about good governance. And it would be really easy to take the example of the IHF. Um, here you've got a president who's been in there 25 years, right? I mean, the culture ossifies in that time, right? There's no refreshment, no renewal and so forth. No, no matter how open or adaptable you are as a person. On the other hand, you've got these huge successes. But I would really like a governance expert to tell me uh, just how much better is a commissioner system in the American franchise model, because they seem to have incredible ranges of powers. So it's dead easy to, to load up one model, like the traditional IF Olympic model, and just say, look at all the bad things that happen when you have a person who can seize a good deal of power over decades. But I'm not sure you know, if it's a really clear contrast between the commissioner model because it strikes me you have an awful lot of powers there located. It's what David Howman said, and, and he's quite right uh, um, this afternoon. It's the people that matter. It's the people that matter. So if you have a commissioner who's a, a saint and a brilliant statistician, economist, mm -hmm. financier, and so forth, it really isn't going to matter, as long as they've got a good heart as well. And it probably doesn't matter in the other case either. So I, I really do think that this massive progress we've made in good governance is, is, is really critical and important. But as Wittgenstein once said, there's no such thing as a rule that applies itself. Right? It's how you apply the rules is the critical thing. And then it all comes down to the quality of the people that you've got running the show, whether it's one person or distributed powers. And, and I might be just wrong there, and I, I invite a governance expert to tell me I am. Thank you very much. I think we have time for the last question. If anybody have a, have a final question to, to finish it off. Um, if, if not, then I actually have a, a question both to, to Ivan and to Jakob. So I think that the way I understand and the way I understand the presentation that you guys made is that you say that sometimes we talk very much about the democracy and the solidarity within our organization. Democracy when it comes, when it's about our membership and the already existing stakeholders that we already have. And you're talking about that you want a model which includes a wider range of stakeholders and democracy in a wider sense. So democracy also when it comes to new people that want to entry into our platform. So what would be a, your solution to this if, if the Olympic movement or the, the European International Federation needs to to open up, is it a matter of just allowing everybody to come in, or should there be a certain model that then are able to create such such an environment where you'll be open to new stakeholders, new sports, new what 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 is the main obstacle for this? <laughs> I know it's a big question, but <laughs> I mean it. it has a lot of refer reference to, you, to your point, but um, in, the, in the extent of uh, trying to build up sports uh, nationally or, or globally, we need to find the solutions on how to be more open for new sports, uh, being it having uh, rules uh, membership-wise, club-wise, but also then following this up in the also actual policy on the day-to-day. -day. Because uh, should the, the summer sport, the winter sports system be implemented all the way down into the national system? I don't think so, because there's so much potential 
and also looking into to, to government funding to the sports system, we need to, to look more into not uh, only the social areas in the society, but also in all of the sports uh, in a broad sense. And uh, I think we could be better in that area. Well, uh, regarding volleyball, uh, the thing is, I think, quite clear. Uh, if you just take an, a current example that uh, the 10 persons who are in the executive board of the, of the European Volleyball Federation, they, they actually don't have any connection with any national federation anymore. And they are there for the last four or five years. And from the other side, we don't want everybody to be involved. We, as written in the white paper from the European community written by the experts, and I completely agree, all the stakeholders recognized and existing in one sport should be involved in the decision-making process. So it's quite clear that uh, about volleyball, we have uh, uh, players, clubs, leagues, national federations, coaches, and these five, six stakeholders. We just want that they are going to represent their members and are going to be elected democratically and having the possibility to change something. And if they're going to change something, we are, we are about to see, but at, at least to have somebody who is democratically elected with the possibility first to be present at the meetings and then uh, to, to pass the real information from the, from the meetings back. I think this is the only way how we can search for, for, for a better, better result for, for everybody. Cool. Thank you very much. And I think unless there's somebody who has a burning, burning question that they, they really need to ask, I think I'm, we're going we're gonna to finish it off here and let people go uh, and enjoy a beer in the bar or what, whatever they, they, they feel like before, uh, before we have too many people snoozing off. But uh, thank you very much to the panel. And I hope you all will, uh, will join me in thanking the panel very much. <laughs> and thank you, thank you very much for all of you who showed up. That's, uh, that was really great, and thank you for the good questions. <laughs>